I'm not sure who came up with the brand name Massive, but whoever they are, they get the award for the cleverest branding in all of car audio. So let's build a box for these Massive 12s. First things first, start by making sure that your tools are all ready to go. This is a digital angle gauge. You can use it to make sure that your saw is perfectly square to your table. That way you don't get a bevel on all of your cuts. That'll cause problems later. And that should be the goal for this entire process. You wanna make sure that when you're breaking down your material, you do it in a way that makes life easier later. For example, this enclosure right here, the top, the bottom, the back, and the baffles are all the same width. So you wanna cut those pieces all at the exact same time. Don't reset the saw in between the cuts. If you make these pieces a smidge too wide or a smidge too short, they'll all be off by the same smidge. You can still assemble the box. You can see here I'm cutting a piece of plywood. This build is gonna use a mix of plywood and MDF. That's gonna be important later. Moving on to the back and the back. Baffles, those are all the same height, so set the saw to that dimension and cut out those three pieces at the same time. I'll be sure to give you a link down below to a video where I explain this process in depth. The tops, the bottoms, the side walls, and the window brace in the middle are all gonna be the same depth, the distance from the front to the back. So you're gonna cut all of those at the same time. Now the sides and the brace and the port walls are also all the same height, so you're gonna cut all of those the same time as well before cutting the port walls to their final length. I've been doing some experimenting with bracing. So for this build, I'm gonna be adding additional bracing and corner 45s. To make those corner 45s, out comes the digital angle gauge. I just uploaded a video where I challenged some of the conventional wisdom behind these braces. I'll make sure to give you a link to that video down below as well. Now comes the most tedious part of the build, cutting out all of the cutouts. You've got to cut out holes for two speakers in two different baffles. You've got to cut out two portholes in two different baffles. And you've got to also trim out that window brace. You start by grabbing a pencil and mark everything out. These red things make the process a lot easier. I used to use combination squares like this until I found these. These are woodpecker knockoffs and they're just as accurate as the woodpeckers and a lot less expensive. They've got holes with the major and minor increments so you just stick a pencil in the hole and start marking. From there, you grab a jigsaw and rough cut everything. And after that's done, you gotta move over to the router table where you're gonna flush trim all of those various cutouts. If you plan on installing a terminal cup, now's a good time to go ahead and cut that hole. Sometimes I forget that. I like using a hole saw for this, but if your plan is to rough cut the hole and trim it on the router, you need to go ahead and do that now while the flush trim bit is in the router. You're already gonna be swapping router bits in and out for this kind of project, so flush trimming everything while the flush trim bit is in the router is an important time-saving tip. And to be perfectly honest with y'all, I'm really beginning to question the logic behind this process. There are a ton of steps required to do all this trimming. Plus it takes extra tools that a lot of DIYers might not have. And not to mention you're constantly burning time swapping out router bits.
Let me show you what I mean. For the speaker cutout, I need a 10 and 7 eighths of an inch hole, but I've got an 11 inch ring. If I cut an 11 inch hole, it's gonna to leave too much slop. The way to undersize that hole is to drop a bunch of extra cash on some bearings so you can oversize your flush trim bit. Plus the extra time invested to change out the bit or the bearing or possibly both. All of that just to get a hole that's undersized by 7 eighths of an inch. The result is not any better than what you would get with a router and a circle jig. So I don't really recommend that the casual DIYer spend their money on these. The only real advantage to using these templates and stuff on the router table is that my router table has better dust collection. I'm gonna cover the majority of the box and carpet and one of those tricks to make your life easier later on is to bust out a rabbit bit. And again, that means changing bits and put a rabbit on the underside of the outer baffle so you've got a place to tuck the carpet and put rabbits on the side so you can get nice clean carpet seams on the side of the enclosure. You're also gonna need a round over bit. I'm gonna put a round over on the outside of the outer baffle. I'm gonna put a round over on the inside of the port and I'm gonna put a round over on that window brace. Now is also a good time to go ahead and assemble the port because you're gonna want a roundover on that inside port radius to get better airflow through the port. Do it now while you have the roundover bit in the router. At this point, most of the sawdust generation is done. There'll be a little bit more we've got to do later on after assembly. Before you do any assembly, always do a dry fit. In fact, looking back, I realized I've made a mistake. I should have done the dry fit before I did all that router work. It would be really frustrating to round over all those pieces just to discover later that something's wrong with them. With the dry fit done, why don't we check out the subwoofer? So here's one of the subwoofers I'm using for this build. I'll be sure to give you a link down below so you can check out all the specs for yourself. As you can tell by how lightweight and easy it is for me to handle this is an entry-level subwoofer and this entry-level sub's got a couple of things that I think are kind of cool and not really expected for an entry-level sub. The sub's got a poly cone, a foam surround, and you can see here a feature you don't see on entry-level subs. It's got a stitch surround. It's kind of overkill for a 300 watt sub, but it's nice to see it. And also the subwoofer has some woven tinsel leads. One thing I think is kind of cool is the vents here on the basket are shaped like the logo for the brand. It's massive. So this is a massive sub. Even though it really clearly isn't massive, it's still massive. One thing I don't like, the subs don't have push terminals. I prefer push terminals, that's just me. One interesting thing about these connectors is there's two on the positive, two on the negative, so you can easily hook multiple subwoofers together. In this case, this is a dual voice coil sub, so we can just parallel the two subs and the two voice coils pretty easily with these style connectors. It's massive. <laughs> Clever. You can assemble the enclosure in any order you like. Do what works for you. I usually start by attaching the back to the bottom. I like to use these parallel clamps. I recommend you pick up a set. Not only do they serve as clamps, they also lift your work up off of your workbench and that gives you room to stick additional clamps up underneath your workpiece if you need them. Some people like to use screws. Some people like to use construction adhesive. I'm a brad nail and wood glue guy, but you should do what works for you. Typically, I attach the sides next before installing the port. If you want to put a corner 45 in the port, do that before you install the port. It's possible to do it after you install the port, it's just a little bit harder. I built so many boxes that I decided to make some port spacers at various common sizes. These spacers really make installing ports and enclosures a whole lot easier. Sometimes the best and most cost effective tools are the ones you build yourself. Before you install that center brace, make sure you take some time to mark off the location for the brace. I like to put these center braces as close to one of the speaker cutouts as possible without blocking the speaker cutouts. So you want to measure and mark carefully. Every now and then I run across a simple tool that is an absolute game changer. 
and that's what this right here is. This is a 3D square. There we go. Being like me, you struggle to keep that brace square and in position whenever you're installing that brace. What I found works really well is to pick up a bunch of these cheap speed squares and use them to hold things into position. You can even clamp them down if you wanted to. I'm a big fan of clamps. I use clamps to hold things in position and then drive the brad nails. You think that maybe I should use these clamps? And when the glue cures, it's gonna stay together just fine. The glue's stronger than the wood. Am I the only one that finds it weird that we call these things squares when they're clearly triangles? This next type of brace is one of my favorites because it's really easy to make and very effective at deadening walls. It's just a chunk of material with some 45s cut in it. Remember when you're placing bracing, you wanna place them at irregular intervals so you can break up those panel resonance. You can see here in this shot that the inner baffle is plywood. The idea here is to carpet most of the box and then stain that plywood to get some contrasting textures and colors. This particular piece of plywood is some scrap I have left over from building some shop furniture. And it's really not the best thing to use for a subwoofer box. I'll show you what I mean a little bit later. After tacking down that inner baffle, you can fill in the nail holes with some wood putty and sand everything smooth. I attached the outer baffle off camera and now I'm installing the top. This is oftentimes a really tight fit and again, the clamps come in handy to force things into place. At this point, the box is assembled, but it's not finished. I have some cool things planned for the next steps. The plan here is to carpet the box and then stain that inner baffle with some unicorn spit. Unicorn spit comes in some really bright eye-catching colors. The idea is to make a bright eye-catching design with some high level of contrast between the carpet and the stain on the plywood. If you want to see that, you need to hit this subscribe button right here. And make sure you ring the bell so you don't miss the video. Before I go, I want to give a big thanks to all of my patrons and channel members. I couldn't afford to run this YouTube channel without them. And here's an extra shout out for $25 and up patrons, Timothy, Jonathan, JD America, and Joaquin.